Okay, so uh, welcome everyone today. It's a pleasure to have Sunny, who will be talking about uh, when nice things don't look like particles. Thank you. Okay. So of course, we know that um, So normally, uh, um, light strings definitely uh, look like particles, and this is um, important for us. First of all, this is main, the main obstacle for making con contact with experiment. If we want uh, to distinguish between the two pictures, we have to put enough energy so that the string looks uh, large enough. This is difficult. Of course, outside the field, people view this as our excuse for not making contact with experiment, but this is a real obstacle. And um, in large systems, this also means that uh, uh, strings look pretty much like particles. If I think about the cause cosmology, and we know that particles don't violate uh, the null energy condition. Um, so since strings look like particles, then they shouldn't violate the null energy condition either. And all the theorems about what cannot happen in cosmology, what cannot happen in black holes is valid, mostly speaking, or something. Of course, uh, what I would like to argue is that in time dependent situations, this is not necessarily the case. And that there are strings that don't look at all like a particle. I would try to focus more on the theoretical side of this statement and maybe a little bit about what it means for. What is I think it's obvious that if this is correct, then there is a feedback to the issues. Okay, so there are two ways to reach this conclusion. One, there is a very long task that I was trying to do last semester uh, on, on flow up, uh, you start with this black hole as residual, it is string information. I think that I stopped somewhere, maybe here. So I'm not, uh, I won't try to, to follow the same path. We'll take a shorter uh, path that begins with a paper uh, by Mandelsena from 2005. Um, so what he did was to consider a two-dimensional linear Dilaton background. So I have, this is time direction, space direction, special direction, and the Dilaton has a, a constant gradient. I take a Q to be positive. So strong coupling is on this side. Time goes up, as usual. And we know that, well, this is, there is an exact CFT description for this uh, background. And in particular, we know that the length scale associated with this um, background is one over Q. So uh, when the sign up took Q to be equal to two, and here I'll, I freely with it, I mostly care about Q that is much smaller than one. So this is a large scale compared to the uh, strength scale. Um, so his point was that there are new solutions and there is a, the characteristic scale associated with them is actually Q. Of course, working with Q equal to two, it's hard to distinguish between the two, between the two scales. So what I would like to do is to uh, uh, spend some time talking about the uh, one solution, and then uh, we'll see what we can what we can do with it. Okay, so this is the solution. Strong coupling is here. Um, so t t is equal to tau in this case. So um, so what we do is we take we, we vary. Sigma, we start at weak coupling. Uh, the string is, goes all the way to a certain point. It folds and it goes back to infinity. Okay. And it does know, according to this equation, we'll talk a little bit about it in a second. What uh, this is doing is basically, it, so where the string folds is exactly supposed to be described by this uh, blue line. And the solution is very intuitive because you see that here 
the fold there's lots of energy, lots of kinetic energy. It goes to the left, but the tension of the folded string is slowing it down. And there is a certain time where it stops. And then the, the tension is pushing it to, uh, 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 to the right, acquiring more and more uh, velocity. Okay, so uh, uh, of course, but such an, uh, an infinitely long string is not described by a particle, but this is expected because the energy is also infinite. So it's obvious that this is not going to be described by a particle. So despite the fact that from a target space of, from the target space point of view, this is a trivial or a, a simple uh, intuitive description, there is something funny about its solution uh, from the uh, logic point of view. Uh, let's see what this is. So the way, so as I said, this is a, a free CFT. So the equation of motion are trivial. The question is the Virasol constraint, which is less trivial because of this linear Dilaton term. Okay. And um, so, as I said, this is the standard term, this is the, the linear Dilaton term. And if I was a bit more careful, then there is the, the string length interval here. And it's uh, uh, interesting in the sense that uh, if you think in effective field theory sense, then this is suppressed compared to this. But without this, you know, you're not going to find the folded string solution. Okay. So the reason why this, this is possible is that it's true that this is suppressed, but it's linear. It's linear in X, so it can take over the constraint for, for a short while. And if you think about this folded string, then here, the standard uh, um, piece of the constraint is the important one. It's possible to fold because of this piece. And then when you go back to infinity, then this takes over again. Okay. So the funny thing is that you have a term that naively should be ignored. It is suppressed in the expansion, but it allows for new solutions that don't exist otherwise. So now you can say, well, this is a very cute story, but still the, the, the target space interpretation is standard. So why do I bring this paper by Juan from 2005? The point is that if I uh, uh, play with it a little bit, then I can make the target space interpretation non standard as well. So instead of having a, a, a Dilaton gradient that is special, what you need to have is a time like. Uh, um, linear Dilaton. So this is the background. And I take you to be <coughs> positive. So the singularity is in the future. And of course, this is maybe the simplest background, cosmological background that you have in string here when people studied this for many, many years. And most of the time, what they did was to take you to be negative. <coughs> In that case, you have uh, the motivation for that is, is that you have a big bang like setup. Here you have a singularity, and the future is it's smooth. Um, but if you do that, you're going to miss uh, uh, this object that I would like to uh, discuss now. So if you take so we take Q to be positive, then what we have uh, is this analytic continuation of the solution that I described before. And this is how it looks like. So this is the, the uh, so we have tau now starts, we start at infinity, we go back in time, we fall and we go up in time. This is what that solution is describing. And we do that again, this is where the string falls. It doesn't look very interesting if you think about it using these coordinates, but if you think about the target space interpretation, then the target space interpretation is quite non-trivial. Here I don't have anything. And all of a sudden something is created, it starts to grow, 
becomes uh, even covered in speed of light becomes huge. Now you can say, okay, but this is standout because there is some time dependence here. So we know that when there is time dependence, things are created. And the example that we have in mind normally is the Schwinger mechanism. And let's compare this to the Schwinger mechanism. Okay. In the Schwinger mechanism, what we have, we have this uh, 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 world line uh, description in which we have the Minkowski section, which we glue to the Euclidean section here. Okay. And uh, uh, that gluing is costing us this piece of the action, which leads to this exponential suppression with the electric field. Now, this is just a picture, but it can be made very, very precise. And this, uh, so these fellows did it as precise as, as you, uh, it doesn't get much more uh, precise than that. Basically, they considered all the possible uh, uh, classical motions, they summed over them, they worried about the, uh, um, the zero modes and all other modes, they summed them and they get exactly the right answer. So uh, uh, this picture is definitely um, something that we should uh, uh, consider. And if you look here, it seems very similar. The fold here is traveling the speed of light. And, you know, eventually the electron will travel at the speed of light and the positron. So you would think that this looks very, very similar, but there are important uh, differences between this picture and that picture. And I would uh, basically, maybe the best way to describe this uh, string is to go over the differences between the Schwinger mechanism and the string. That's, that's what I'm doing. Uh, are you saying that the fault positions are roughly like charges, uh, analogous to charges? Well, right, so, so the fault, exactly. So it, it looks as if this is really as if you're doing like it. Can you see it from the effective action in the sigma model? That, uh... so what I'll argue now is that this is not what is happening. Mm. The, so, because it, on the surface, the effective action looks different. Right, yeah. and it is different. Exactly. Yeah, one has curvature coupling and uh, has this. Yes, it's very different. Mm -hmm. And uh, exactly what I want to do now is to go over the differences, which will um, emphasize why this is a non trivial object. It's not, uh, it doesn't fall into the standard categories that we Is there an open string analog of your expanding string solution? Yeah. Uh, no, so, uh, uh, well, there is a, there is an open string analog of the Schwinger mechanism. But that is just the open string, right? Uh, that's like uh, yeah, but it is <laughs> there. You do have exponential suppression. I don't think that there is an analog of that. We can't think of just open string endpoint. Uh, well, that's a good question. You're saying, if I, can I do something on the brand that will do that? you cut the folded string. Yes, yes. Uh, I don't think that you can. Well, I don't know how to do it. Let's put it like that. <laughs> Maybe the little way, but I don't know how to do it. Okay, so uh, differences. Uh, 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 yes, so this is a classical solution. So here, what, what is being done is I'm, I'm gluing a, a, a Euclidean classical solution with a Minkowski one. Here, all of this is a classical solution in Minkowski space, so there is no tunneling involved. So we don't expect any exponential suppression. Um, this string does not feed from the background. Its energy is all the time zero. So if I think about uh, these guys here, they are created at rest, and then they start to accelerate. Their energy grows, it comes from the electric field. This is not the case here. Here, the energy is zero, zero, zero. We'll talk about that in a second, what, what, what it means. And uh, another difference is that if you take the electric field to be large, to be small, then the uh, creation scale is large. But here, if you take the slope of the Dirac to be small, the creation scale is small. 
No, I thought you said this is a time dependent background. So why is there any conserved energy? I'll talk about that. So I'll elaborate on each one of these points. I'm just thinking in general. Okay, so so uh, uh, so you you can calculate the production rate. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this calculation in a second. Uh, what you get is this answer, and this is expected since this is a classical solution. Why you get the rest? I'll talk about in a second. Um, now, to uh, uh, Nima's question, um, yeah. So the point is that the point that I would like to uh, elaborate on is how come that this is, uh, uh, despite the fact that I have uh, uh, time dependence, the energy vanishes and the, um, the linear dilaton is just a trigger for the creation of these cells and they don't, uh, uh, they don't provide any energy for it. So the reason is basically that this background is invariant under time translation from the fundamental state point of view. And you can see this from the fact that you have a zero module. Okay, so in this solution, you can create it wherever you want, and the energy will be zero. Yes, I don't know, I should say the other way around. The fact that I can create it at any point means that the energy is zero. Now, uh, of course, of course, we did a calculation to check this. So you can calculate the energy momentum tensor associated with such a solution. And you can see that the integral vanishes. Okay. But of course, we have a folded string here. So this piece costs less energy than that piece, et cetera, et cetera. And we have to compensate for this if we want to get a, a vanishing energy. And this is, this is happening at the fold. So basically, the way that it works is that there is a negative energy flux that feeds into it. So the string is feeding itself. The, it's, the energy, the fact that the string is growing, it's not, it's not coming from the Dillerton gradient, but it comes from itself. Okay. So the fact that we have this negative energy flux means something that we normally don't like, and that the, the, the anic is violated. So if I take a slice and not slice like here, like here, here I have zero, here I have zero, we get negative contribution from this. And this means that these creatures, they uh, uh, violate uh, something that normally is not supposed to be uh, violated. Well, actually, the part filter does violate the anode, except they do that special condition. You mean that if you don't have a close? Yeah, yeah. Okay, when the kernel D doesn't, which is very scarce to, for the anode to be true. Right. But, right. <laughs> this is a classical solution, so the fact that it's violated. But why can't the fact that the kernel filter violates the normal energy? If instead of anode, it's a normal energy condition, you say it would be clear. Yes. It possibly there's a normal energy condition. Right. If quantum theory violates it, why do we think string theory should not? Um, I, I like the solution. So I, I, I think that this is a feature of the, the line, solution. The, I mean, the line on which he considers the ENIAC is, is uh, well, it's an inexpensive line in Minkowski space. But it goes into strong coupling. Right. It's analogous to the right. 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 So if it is analogous to the singularity, that wouldn't be the case of the. Okay, um, so, so I, I'm not going to talk too much about this. This is, as far as I can tell, this is just the feature of the solution. And uh, it, of course, it leads to many uh, results. But what I would like to do is uh, basically to elaborate as much as we can about the, uh, whether we should uh, or we shouldn't believe this story. Okay, so the third point was that the creation scale is tiny when Q is small. And this is also, this has uh, also important uh, uh, consequences because it means that, the, um, that this happens whenever I have a local, whenever locally I have a time like uh, uh, Dilaton gradient, it might be, it might be, the, well, it's not, it's going to be that the, the details of the solution are going to look different 
but the fact that you have such a creature that uh, is going uh, at the speed of light will happen whenever I have a time like the Elton gradient. And this is because of this property and the rate I can, cal I can calculate in standard. Okay, um, so the situation, so here is, here, is the, here is the point. The point is that uh, these things, which I like to call instant folded states because they are created at an instant, um, they definitely cannot be approximated by a particle. There is no particle trajectory to describe them. And uh, the energy vanishes. The fact that the energy vanishes means that uh, it can modify uh, the infrared drastically. And uh, the fact that it cannot be approximated by a particle means that it does so in a way that light particles don't. So as I said, it violates the ANEC and this should be interesting for black holes for cosmology. So this is the motivation why uh, I uh, keep thinking about these instant for these things. I have a trivial question, if I may. Can you go back to the previous slide? Yeah. So the string is getting longer as a function of time. Right. And is that longer in the string metric or in the Einstein metric, or both? This is well. Yes. Uh, uh, this happens. But well, this picture is in the string metric, but the same happens also in the Einstein metric. So is it getting longer in the Einstein metric or not? Yes, it does. There is positive energy in the back of the string and negative at the top of the tips. Right. Yeah, but how does this energy, the positive and negative, how do they depend on time? Well, the total energy vanishes. The total energy is always, so here you don't have anything, the energy is zero. Okay? And then at each time the energy is zero, there is a constellation between what is happening in the bulk of the string. At the, 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 Wonder it. We have like more and more tension in this longer and longer string, and there's some negative mass at the ends of the string that are canceling it, which is also growing with time. What's weird with your final tau is that it looks like the solution is coming in from the future and then going back to the future. Right. 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 So, so tau is is tau is the uh, is the coordinate in which it's easiest to describe the solution. But when you think about the target space interpretation, this is the target space. Interpretation. So that, when I said that the energy vanishes, I, I mean with respect to T. The induced metric on the function doesn't uh, change signature. No. The metric, the, the wall chip is just R11. Oh, no funny doing it. Basically, exactly what you did. I'm not changing anything. As far as the, met, uh, the wall chip. I'm still confused about the previous question. So the, is the tension getting smaller as we go to- The tension to... is constant. The tension is constant. There is this, uh, uh, I think that the effect that you are worrying about is the Dilaton effect which takes you from one frame to the other. Uh, well, this is not since, well, this is a function of T, but at any time the energy is zero, so it doesn't really matter. It's not the time, it's not that this part, that the boundary of the string is going, it is transforming differently than the bulk of the string. So it's the, the statement that the energy vanishes is true in the Einstein and in the string at the top of the number. So I know you explained already, but strong coupling is the top of your picture. Yes, strong coupling is up. Yes. Uh, so uh, only travel faster than light? Yes, so, the, 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 so here you can see that it's, uh, infinite, and it, it's approaching the speed of light, the uh, infinite. Okay, so uh, yes, so uh, uh, I talked about this, but there is this, uh, um, well, this, I think, I view this as a nice feature that the fact that the, these strings don't look like particles, this uh, might be viewed, uh, well, as it might give us some hope of making contact with experiment, 
And I would, uh, so for example, in a cosmological setup in which all of them are created uh, homogeneously, then uh, they will give negative pressure um, at no energy cost, because each one of them has zero energy. So the energy density in cosmology associated with them is going to vanish, but they will provide negative pressure. So they violate uh, the null energy condition maximally. Okay? So if I'm being extremely optimistic, then, and if the other tension is correct, then there are some uh, uh, proposals that people made about early dark energy. Uh, and these guys can provide a similar, uh, um, well, yeah, a minute about that. So we sit here, Dilaton is here, and we, the Dilaton has a company like that. So what will happen is that when we, there is a transition from radiation dominated universe to the uh, metal dominated universe, then this will kick in. So this will go up and down. And during this movement, instant for these things will be created. They will generate um, negative pressure at no energy cost. And maybe if this is correct, and if this is the right approach, and if we have, enough uh, uh, measurements in the future to distinguish between this and the early dark energy that does cause energy, then uh, maybe this, this can be uh, even measured. At any rate, we don't have this string looks like uh, particles excuse anymore. Okay, what I would like to focus on is, is on the fact that because they don't look like uh, particles, they cannot be described as usual by one comma one operator on the world sheet. And the question is, uh, so we had this picture at the beginning, we all know how to think about it on the world sheet. And the question is, what should we do with this, uh, uh, with this guy? It cannot be a one comma one operator. Well, we see this from this picture but also from the fact that the solution as the wall chip is R11 and it's not a cylinder, so I cannot think about it as a local operator on the wall chip. But the question is what we can do. And uh, Juan was uh, uh, kind enough to give us the answer to that question in the space-like case. So in the space-like case, we know that um, it's not only that you have that so the these solutions appear. So I think that let's see, I have the singularity on the other side. So now the strong coupling is here. And um, we have the string here. And uh, uh, another thing that happens when you have a linear dilaton is that there is this SVT brain, boundary uh, uh, brain. And what you can do on that brain is you can imagine having an open string that comes with lots of energy. It propagates until it's basically it's running out of brain. And then, but it still has lots of energy. So it's forming a, a folded string that goes to the right. Eventually the energy, the tension of the string is pulling it back and we'll have an open string that goes to the future. So what this means is that I can think about a regularized version of this open string, of this folded string as a two-point function on the SVT brain. And uh, you can, to make it precise, you can see that this process is a pure phase. And if you take the momentum or the energy of these particles to be large, then you get three contributions. One is the linear contribution coming from the propagation on the brain. The other one is, it goes like P squared, and this is the area of the folded string. And the coefficients here are exactly as they should be. And there is the last piece, which, which is the only place where you see the dependence on Q. And this comes, this is due to the, to the fold of the string. 
And to show this, you can, you, what you have to do is you have to look on the trajectory that the fold is forming, ask yourself what kind of uh, 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 potential uh, will correspond to this and you'll, you'll get exactly this phase. Okay, so, uh, so the question is whether we can uh, recrotate this picture uh, or not. So before uh, uh, Juan's paper, there was a, a very nice paper by Guttal and Strominger, which appeared a couple of years before. And what they did was to think about the time-like FCVT brain, and they calculated the production rate of open strings on this uh, uh, bound on this um, time-dependent brain. Now, they encountered many uh, puzzling results in the uh, calculation, and things makes much more sense when you understand that these two guys are really the endpoint of, uh, of an instant for those things. So uh, I think that presumably if the order was the opposite, then they would have uh, realized all of that. But Juan's paper appeared a couple of years after that. And uh, so our job was basically to try to glue uh, the, what, what they did with, um, with the instant folded strings. And it's very easy to recrotate the three phases that I talked about before. Uh, there is some bookkeeping because the calculation that you, that you do here is basically you calculate this production, you basically calculate the, the, the production rate of these two open strings starting from nothing. And what we had to do was you basically to chop this off and focus on this. And this is how we got this result. Now, the challenge is of course to do this properly because if you we rotate uh, an expansion, and this is an expansion, then there is a chance that you're getting the wrong answer. And so the challenge was to uh, uh, do it properly in the sense that we, first of all, we weak rotate the two point function that, uh, uh, of FCVT, and only then take the large P limit. And this gives a, a, a contribution from an infinite a number of poles that conspire to vanish when the momentum goes to uh, infinity. Uh, so the upshot of all of this is that uh, FCZ, time like FCT brain is a good regulator to the instant for the strings and that this is the production rate. So GS is the coupling where? Yes, so GS is the coupling here. You get something that goes like one over G. For weak coupling, it looks like it is. Well, I, I don't know exactly what you're worried about. So, so yes, good. So there are two. Uh, uh, um, so uh, uh, one is worrying about the one over G squared, and I would like to uh, claim now that you, this passes two tests. One is indirect, and one is direct. And the direct one is, I think, is related to exactly to what you are one. So the indirect is the uh, uh, black hole entropy. The dilaton gradient behind the horizon of uh, K and S5 brains uh, is time-like and it points to the future. So this means that the interior, if this story is correct, then the interior of the black hole is not empty but it's filled with these instant for the strings. And uh, this is uh, very much related to what uh, Amit Givon and I, well, the other direction that we uh, push, um, since the starting point here is exactly this uh, near extremal and a five ways. And uh, the question is whether this is related to the black hole entropy at some uh, the more qualitative level and not just a statement that the black hole interior is empty. Can we make this a bit more precise? And we can. Uh, to do that, what we have to do to ask ourselves is suppose that I have an infalling observer. 
right? This is this um, red, red um, curve over there. And we can ask how many instances, so if the black hole was empty, then of course this guy would not meet too many uh, instant folded strings. But the question is how many instant folded strings this infolding observer will meet. And regardless of the endpoint, you can do a very a simple calculation. Basically, each, so you have the cause of diamond here. Every instant folded string that is created in this cause of diamond will affect this infolding observer. This is a simple calculation to do. And you see that the number of instant folded strings it goes like the entropy of this black hole, which suggests that uh, the two are very much uh, related. Uh, of course, uh, to make this precise, we have to worry about the back reaction. Um, and the back reaction uh, is, is a tricky thing to do, but there is one, well, if, if I declare that I put all of them here at the horizon bifurcation, then you can show that the back reaction of the instant folded string will give you exactly ADS2, of course, with constant uh, uh, dilaton. And uh, the challenge here is to map, to find a map, if there is such a map, between the boundary of ADS2 and the lock of, suppose that I don't put all of them here, I start to move them around. What's the relation between the location of the instant folded strings and the ADS2 that uh, you get to? Okay. Um, so this is, so let's uh, talk about the direct test. So there is one over G squared here, and this means that this is a new uh, instability from the point of view of this background, of the climate linear dilaton background. Okay, uh, so if this is the case, then we should see it at the level of the sphere partition function. Okay, so let's think uh, uh, ideally we, we would do the following. We start with the vacuum at some time, and we ask ourselves what's the probability to end in the vacuum at a later time. Of course, if there are no instant folded strings, then that probability would be one. But if there are, then it's going to be uh, smaller than one. It's going to be given by this expression. Okay. This is correct, and that's, that will be important in a second when the, in the dilute gas approximation where Q is much smaller than one, otherwise the back reaction, how one affects the other will become important. And uh, if I plug uh, our expression that this is what you get, there might be a factor of two from here. You do this integral and this is what you get. Um, and the, the, the single particle, a single string partition function should be given by this expression. Okay. So there is a clear prediction here that the single string partition function in this case should be given by this expression. It is dominated by P naught because the string coupling is blowing up, it, it's going to zero here. And we, we have one over G squared. Okay. This is why all of this is controlled by what is happening here. Of course, in string theory, I cannot do this calculation. I cannot just declare that I start here and I end there. Okay, but what I can do is I can put a new wheel wall that will cut this piece. Now I'm putting a bulk new wheel wall. And well, I cannot tune it to be exactly where I want because this is an exponential potential. So this is why I cannot fix right now this number seal, but uh, I cannot, I, I can put the available somewhere here. And then basically the, the only things that, that are created are created here. So uh, luckily this partition function was calculated by a uh, you repeat quite time, uh, maybe like uh, what, 11 years ago. And uh, this is what he found. The way that he is doing uh, the calculation is 
the bit uh, is using this uh, um, um, but then I'll talk about this maybe. Um, okay, uh, then again, this is what, what we got. Wait, sorry, in, in, in that formula, wouldn't the local wall be in the strong coupling region? Uh, no. Is it the opposite side? I don't think so. Yeah, usually in the local wall, you've got sort of the strong coupling. Yes, region. but you are in a time like setup, in a time like setup, you can put it in whatever. So, so you can, you're right that I could have. Okay, so, so, okay, let's uh, see what was. So, this, so a version of this calculation in the space like this will give the uh, answer the dramatological gap using the standard, uh, it, using this approach, which is more uh, a standard. Um, in the time like what you can do is you can put the wall either here. Over here, and famously, even in the space like you don't get the same answer. Well, the logic of the answer is not the same. So this B goes to one over B is not the symmetry of the of the partition function. Okay. So for us, it's important that we take this because this will cut off the calculation. The other thing, I don't know what to do. Okay. So this is what you get, and now. Uh, we have to compare, of course, this is just uh, the KPZ scaling, so this doesn't, uh, uh, this is by construction. But this thing is the non trivial uh, check. If you take a Gilibet uh, answer and you take you to be small, then this is what you get. You get minus Q, just like what this uh, instant voltage string is giving you. So, in a sense, at least at that level, you're one over this square. I think it's uh, okay. Is it positive or negative? Seems positive. Seems positive. So, and 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 in principle, C can be calculated because I meant the set one. Is it positive or negative? The what? Set the partition function. Oh, the set the one. Yeah, is negative. I mean, the previous formula you had something that went like e to the e to the set one. And where you're saying, what well, I'm saying is that you have this. This is the usual. So when you have this it, looks like a space time instant on effect that goes like one over three squared. Right. Okay. So this is, yes. So, um, so this is it has to be e to the zero. So when you do, you know, the one uh, uh, particle coefficient function is exponentiated, you exponentiate it without the minus sign. In. That's important for. for we have minus. Uh, okay, so where were we? Oh, I see that that was the overlap. Your sense the overlap is very, very tiny. Right, right, okay. right, right. Exactly. Um, okay, so there is, if the, the things that I didn't talk about provide uh, more evidence. Um, so, as far as I'm concerned, right now, these guys are really part of string theory, and we have to learn how to uh, uh, work with them. And uh, another question that I would like to talk uh, to address now is how they alone, basically, do we get instant folded uh, D brains and instant folded and uh, five brains and other things like that? And the conjecture is that we do. Um, so let's uh, uh, take the, the, the long version for all of this. So one way to see this uh, is to uh, consider a version uh, of the um, thermofield uh, double that we are all familiar with in ADS5, and to consider instead near extremal uh, D1 brains. So this is a, a slightly less familiar uh, uh, large N case. So what's happening there is that the theory is well described at the UV using perturbation theory. When we go to the infrared, we go to strong coupling and there is a, 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 a type two background to describe uh, the theory. Eventually it becomes strongly coupled. We have to apply F duality and we have another background that describes it. And at the deep infrared, there is a matrix a string description, which is also perturbative. 
Okay, so here we have perturbation theory. Here we have perturbation theory, and here we have a background. Okay, so since we have perturbation theory, we can write things in the usual way. And since the theory is on a, on a circle, then uh, we get a discrete spectrum and a Poincare recurrence is clear. And now we have Poincare recurrence at the deep infrared, we have Poincare recurrence at the UV, and the variant of uh, uh, Juan's version of the black hole information puzzle is what's, what is happening here. So uh, just to remind you, uh, uh, this version of the black hole puzzle is the following. The horizon is always smooth for a black hole, which means that near the horizon, we, can, we have a, a continuous spectrum. And as a result, there is no uh, Poincare recurrence, while here clearly there is Poincare Okay, so uh, I would like to uh, argue now, so there will be a two steps uh, uh, argument now. The first step is to argue that this question mark can be addressed using instant folded strings. And then the question is what is happening here? And I would like to argue that instant folded D1 brains will help here. Okay. So this, this is the logic. So uh, if I go to the near horizon of near extremal fundamental strings, if I take N to be large, then as usual, I end up with Minkowski space. Uh, nothing special at the horizon. There is a small dealer term uh, which uh, points away from the black hole uh, uh, if you are going from the horizon, if you are thinking about the um, going in the space side direction, but towards the horizon uh, in the uh, upper and lower uh, wedges. So this is definitely not too exciting for ordinary strings. They will just propagate. They might get a tiny kick to the left or to the right, but they will just propagate them. But if you think about how strings can fall, then you see that something funny is happening because strings can fall here. This is a time-like direction. It points to the future. So strings can fall in this direction. Here, the uh, gradient is to the right, but this is a space-like direction, so strings can fall towards that point as well, and as well in these other two wedges. Okay. So in, in particular, what you can have is you can have an instant folded string that is created here, and it penetrates a bit to the right and left wedges before it decays. Okay. So again, when epsilon is small, the production rate is, is tiny. So you should not get too excited about the uh, creation of instant folded strings. But the, but the uh, uh, eternal black hole is eternal. And if this guy exists, then all of these boosted guys also exist. And it means that if somebody is trying to fall into the black hole, it will have to uh, cross an infinite number of instant folded strings. And this seems to support this proposal that uh, Bourbon and Rabinovich had uh, as a reaction to uh, uh, Juan's paper that a uh, stringy structure just outside the horizon is what is needed to, to find a detailed agreement between the two point function of the time. Okay, so. So previously we said that you know there is a smooth horizon, there is a continuous spectrum, so no Poincare recurrences. Now I don't know how to calculate the back reaction, but it doesn't. If this if this holds, then the horizon does not seem to be smooth. Maybe if I knew how to calculate the back reaction, I could have proven this. But it's reasonable that maybe the spectrum now is discrete, and now there will be Poincare recurrence. So this, the situation is, is, is the following. We knew that here there is Poincare recurrence. We have an argument why there might be Poincare recurrence here. And the question is what is happening here? Now, if this is correct, 
then it makes no sense that there is no Poincare recurrence here because this is just a transition in supergravity between one black hole to the other. But instant folded strengths cannot do, are not help with, the, cannot help with this question mark because if they are created, they are created in the future horizon, they are not created in the past horizon. So something else has to uh, uh, save the day. Now, this background is as dual to this background. So the naive proposal is that uh, when we go to negative epsilon, then uh, when we have a time-like Dilaton gradient that points to the past, then it triggers the creation of instant folded uh, D1 brains. And then we have a situation in which uh, basically we have the same picture, like now we have, only that now we have a, a, a small and negative epsilon. So here I have instant folded D1 brains. And um, the same should be all. So th there is a, so this this conjecture I believe is provable, and I, I not that I know it's true, but I can reformulate it. Um, pointing to the past means the goal time increases from the past. Pointing to the yes, the common yes, yes, yes. So. What this means, I think, so the, the, the space-like version of this is that if this is weak coupling, this is weak coupling, this is strong coupling, then so I have a singularity here, then I, the space-like version of this would mean that in, in such a, a, a case, there should be a, a D1 brain, a folded D1 brain that is following this, um, uh, now, it feels like this, so th there is this uh, uh, Erpin. Erpin is a, a brain that is doing something like this in Euclidean setup. And if you analytically continue time, so in the Euclidean setup, there is the exact uh, uh, boundary state that corresponds to the to the serpent, if you analytically continue time, you get something that is doing this. There is a large scale here. And I think that this creature should be basically, if there is a D0 brain here, then there should be a D1 brain that is glued to it and it's making it look like that. So at least at the level of pictures, and if this is correct, then we analytically continue and we prove this this conjecture. So uh, I think that there is a chance that this is possible. Uh, now, of course, if this conjecture is correct, then we can apply a T duality and then we get other uh, instant folded uh, DP brains and they are triggered because T duality mixes the dilaton with some other scalars, which are related to the size of the, the compact direction, then these guys will be triggered by other independent uh, uh, um, scalars. Okay, so let me uh, summarize. So, uh, so instant folded strings are light and they are created uh, uh, classically in time dependent, uh, when you have time dependent uh, dilaton. They cannot be approximated by particles. And this means that the infrared is drastically different. So for example, I didn't talk about that, but in a cosmological setup, what will happen is that the effective uh, um, equation of motion for the dilaton now, so normally we don't have this term, we have the Hubble friction. Um, but now because when the dilaton is running, changing with time, it will create these, these instant folded strings that generate negative pressure. They will uh, uh, have this extra term. So you, so you get a negative friction at weak coupling, which is kind of interesting if you uh, think about the um, um, phenomenological aspects of such an equation. Um, of course, there are challenges. There is a Wolchip challenge, which is to 
find a better way to work with the strings and for the strings other than taking the uh, after the key brain two point function this is very if you try to calculate interactions and things like that this is a very uh, complicated way to do a business with them there is the uh, target space challenge and it is to understand whether uh, this ionic violation really leads to problem with causality to have problems with causality, namely to go back in time and tell somebody not to do something that you won't exist, <coughs> then uh, you have to control exactly what you're doing. Just having time advance is not by itself, this is not causality violation. But the challenge here is to either prove that these guys do not lead to a causality violation or to prove that they do, in which case, we should, uh, I should find something else to um, And we don't, use, we don't have this uh, strength looks like particles, which I think is uh, interesting and uh, have several ideas about what, what can be done with them. The last thing is that uh, instant folded strings seems to be just the, the tip of the iceberg and uh, there should be other creatures that are uh, uh, created when other scales are very good time. So with that, I'll, I'll... Is the whole story one plus one dimensional? Hmm. Oh. And, and, and I mean, in one plus one dimension, you can avoid problems, but... But if you can have regions where you can massively violate the A and X, then you just have to take two of them slightly, displace them in transverse directions, and then you can go back. Then you can make close, right. close, close that one. The question is whether you can. So if you could declare that you create one here and another there, and put some mirrors or whatever, then you can then you can do it. But the problem is that to do that, you have to. Uh, so the the trigger is the electron gradient. And you have to control them. And when you do it, you are paying. So, so the different gradient here should be different than here. You want, suppose that I want to have an object here and here. So here I have something here, I don't have anything, and here I have something. So there is a second derivative. Now uh, it's so different. You can make it change it very gradually, right? right. But, because, then, yeah. but then but then but then what's happening is that you because of the uh, better function equations to learn curvature. Or if you want, there is energy momentum tensor associated with what you are creating, which uh, uh, will make it much more difficult to assign. As far as I can see, there is no obvious way to violate Azali. Okay. But uh, uh, this is. Uh, would you say that strings wound around the compact dimension have like particles? Or do you take that? I mean, those are created, certainly created by one one vertex operator. Right. But if this compact direction, what do you want to do with the compact? Oh, you want to take it to be the critical value? Uh, I don't know. Well, and if they're sort of wound around the large distance. Really. But then they cost. Uh, uh, are not light. Right? Right. Right. So the question whether you can have something that is light and doesn't look like a particle. Mm -hmm. I know this folded string that say moves in the or space like linear dilaton in one plus one dimension. The, fold, the moving fold, there is a kind of dual picture where you if you continue time to Euclidean, then you it's related to winding and right. rewinding right. parallel. Right. So what, yes, so so it is. So what you can do, so if you so that solution, so you can analytically continue, uh, let's say sigma, and then instead of course you will get a cos, and then you can uh, have a winding. Right. And so these solutions are. Uh, uh, in, in uh, matrix quantum mechanics, this is like H9, H9. So the, the, the time-like version of this is not terribly clear to me. I see. The way you can do it, I'm not sure what to make out of it. You can, 
it seems like there is something there, but I can't quite pinpoint what. Yes. So, so uh, you have this positive tension strain, and these sort of two effectively negative mass particles at the end. And so, F equals MA because the mass is negative, it's pushing them out rather than uh, making the strain go back in. So, why don't you worry? I mean, so there's the normal strain, and then there's these particles at the end of the strain. Why don't we worry about all the normal things we worried about with these negative mass particles? Which is vacuum instability. Uh -huh. Vacuum instability. I mean, no, because you cannot create them without the strain. You can't create them without the strain. Okay. I, I truly don't see right now what's wrong with you. As far as I can see down there. Yes. Yeah, so, sorry if I missed the point, but would you, so back to the space side case, would you yeah. call the, the long strings that present one in this paper? Also, like that, that they don't look like particles. We have this. Hi, different. Don't talk about yeah. but, but they they have, I, mean, I would say that they are. They, the tip does look like the a particle. Tip. Yeah, like this. Once you yes, take yes. a careful limit of uh, saying the brain to infinity and then compensating with dark energy for the open string, the tip you can compute is uh, scattering amplitudes between different different yeah. long strings and right. close strings. Yeah. And you know they they need to well define as major tell me. Yes, I know you. I know you. I know. I call that a particle, right? Well, oh, I'm aware of of, of your uh, uh, work on that. I would uh, uh, yes. So the tip, the statement that I made was that the one's long string as a whole is not approximated by particle. Now it's true that the tip in this in this problem. Uh, um, is acting like a particle, but uh, which I think is, is so. I think that in this case, I'm, I'm kind of, of hopeful that maybe uh, if you have a time dependent situation which is not uh, trivial, not constant, then you could find at least you know the trajectory of the of the of the fold. I don't think that you can find the full a solution if you have a non trivial background, but at least. Because there is a sense in which the fault does act like a part. This I think should so when I so so when I, I said that there should be a better description than taking the FCT brain and taking it to infinity, then the op is exactly that. That you could uh, find a way to, you know, to be with it without doing all of that. Is that I would have said like a more naive construction of this or responsive solution, classical solution would be some FCCT brain that extends in time, but just takes at some position and a long open, long open string, like going like this. You, you drew this at um, some point, but once you forget about the construction, well, it's just in, in, in the space like this or in the timeline? In the timeline. Okay. So you do the FCCT is in space, but now time like this. Oh, so you want to add. Uh, um... You want to add a, a gradient also, a different okay. gradient in the, just in time, so what? So it's like an MCCT brain, but in time. All right, so this is uh, right. what Storm and Gio and Luther started, yes. But then you would forget about that construction and just say the tip of that long string is just a particle. I would, love, I would love to be able to do it. All I'm saying is that I don't know how to do it. Well, it's a it's weird part. I also don't know about that. The negative mass part. But but that particle is not going to capture everything. <laughs> in the cosmological setup, the reason why you get the negative uh, uh, pressure at no energy cost involves also the strain. So you cannot, if you, it, it cannot be just a particle because then you have the uh, vacuum. <laughs> uh, basically, you're getting the tension of the string, but uh, sorry, getting the pressure of the string, which is negative, but the overall energy. Here you had a, a no, but I mean, mass of siliton, no, no, it's like just running away to a strong pressure. Imagine, it's just imagine, I don't know. We, I mean, you, you care about maybe it's not something in the real world. We're going to stabilize the siliton with a potential. So it stops at some point. What, what happens to this funny object when, when you stop? Yeah, you, that, that funny object will, so I, I, 
You have the super long thing. With yeah, yeah, but it's not yeah. time to be that. Now it's not time to have it anymore. So what's going to happen? Right. So it will decay along the photo. So the lifetime is roughly like one of those years. So uh, these guys, so, so let me uh, write the um, So if I think about cosmology, then uh, they will give you a, a negative pressure that is roughly, this is the zero point, uh, one of the G squared. And then there is the lifetime of the, this picture. The lifetime, eventually they will decay because you can, it's thing can break. So this will also go like one of the G squared. If you multiply this by G Newton, then what happens is that you get... Sorry, what is it breaking to? What? I mean, it's... A, a, is it breaking to something else that has these negative masses on this endpoint? Is it breaking into other? Uh, Are you asking what state? Time? What is the end state? Like, let's say, let's say you stop this time-dependent background. I want to know you have this now negative mass objects, this huge yes. string of zero energy, no. zero quote-unquote energy yes. beforehand. But now everything is stopped and no longer time dependent. So what does this turn into at the end? Well, it depends on whether you're in the linear or zero sum case. In the pure linear Dilaton case, or whether you are in a, in a uh, setup in which the Dilaton um, is going to be a second derivative to the Dilaton. If you are in a pure Dilaton case, then what they will decay to. So, in that case, what you have, you have also perturbative tachyons with a, with a mass that is uh, uh, minus Q squared. So, they can decay into those. Okay. But in the in cases in which you don't have this, then what's up? What will happen is that so the situation is the following: if you have a constant linear uh, dilaton, then you have these guys, and they can and they will and then the energy is all the time zero, and they will decay to this. If the second derivative is uh, is non-trivial, then what will happen is that the energy will grow a little bit. Because then, will, because then the background there is some dependence on mine. It's like a cosmological setup, okay? And they will decay into massless particles. But at any rate, the lifetime is one of the So they are not going to they are not going to get this infinitely huge. Okay. Um, Do we, do we have any last questions, maybe on Zoom? If not, then let's thank Sami last.